Hello, I am Dr. Christy Balcom. I am a large animal veterinarian over in Kihei and Maui. Um, I am boarded in large animal internal medicine with a focus on livestock. Um, so today we're going to be talking about first aid care in livestock. Um, going through uh, the basic outline is when is the time that you actually need to call a veterinarian? Um, what are some common emergency situations? Um, and how to triage and provide first aid care for some of the more common things that can happen until you can get someone on farm to have a look. Um, and then I have also a list of things that you can include in your emergency kit. And it kind of varies and there's a few different changes through there, but at least it's an outline to go off of. So what is an emergency situation? Um, it's different for everybody, uh, but the main thing is any situation that you are not comfortable handling. So there may be situations where an experienced uh, producer might be able to have dealt with this uh, multiple times in the past few years. So some dystocias or birthing difficulties or assisting with kidding or mastitis or things like that that they might be able to handle. But for the most part, especially for a lot of people that are newer to livestock, or to animals, a lot might be out of their depth. So any, anything that you feel that you cannot handle or that your animal's life is in immediate danger, um, these are major times that you would need to call for help. Uh, the biggest thing is that it is better to be prepared uh, than to be at the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, but unfortunately we know that happens. Often these things occur after hours because you come home from work and you find someone strung up in a tree or uh, there's issues. The biggest concern is that it's not Friday afternoon at 4.30 when you've been watching something been going on all week. So how to pick up when there are things that you can do ahead of time and when to call for help. So uh, examples of emergency situations are any urinary obstruction in male sheep and goats. So anytime your uh, weather or your weather, your pet lamb or anything like that is not urinating and it is a male, um, this is an emergency. Their bladder, we'll talk a little bit about it more later. Um, anytime you have a ewe or a doe who is expected to give birth, please do not wait on that overnight and say she's been in labor all night and never got around to it. Uh, this needs to be seen immediately for the life of both babies and for the mothers. A prolapse of a uterus or a vagina. Generally, a uterus is an emergency situation. Vagina, not so much. We'll talk a little bit about how to differentiate between the two. Anytime you have sick babies, um, their systems are just so much more precarious that any kind of um, sickness can potentially cause them to go downhill very, very quickly. It's much harder to deal with them. Uh, they're a little bit more delicate. So anytime you have a neonate, so anything that's being nursing, not eating, if you have diarrhea, they can become dehydrated very, very quickly and go downhill very quickly. Um, any kind of weakness, because they can be susceptible to low blood sugar or hypoglycemia, swollen joints or fever, these need to be addressed as soon as possible for the best outcome. Large amounts of blood loss, so if you come home, uh, your animals have been fighting and there's blood spurting from a horn base or they get caught in a fence or any other kind of trauma. Uh, diarrhea in adult animals, if it's been going on for more than a couple of days, if they have really pale FAMACHA scores, so the inner eyelid um, suggests that they're very anemic, they have bottle jaw, so swelling under the jaw, signs of parasitism, um, you have a better chance of survival if it if they get treated much sooner rather than later. Um, as we talked about before, any kind of trauma, so attack by dog, those severe wounds, they need to be addressed as soon as possible to get the better um, prognosis and to fight off infection as well. And anytime you have an animal that's down and not eating or drinking, there are so many different causes for why they might be like that. You really need to be able to... Um, you really need to be able to assess the situation because not every situation has the same treatment and they need to be evaluated by a veterinarian. So the first thing we talked about is urinary obstruction. So male sheep and goats were really of any species can develop bladder stones and they get stuck in the very tip of the urethra. Unfortunately, due to plumbing and anatomy, that is the narrowest area of the urethra. And so these little stones that can form, they look like little gold BBs, little copper BBs. 
um, or can just be uh, crystals can get stuck there and prevent urine outflow. This causes the bladder to become very enlarged. It's incredibly painful. Um, usually you see them kind of standing with their legs stre stretched out. They look like they're straining to defecate it or the defecate or they're constipated. Uh, sometimes they may cry when they urinate. It's not a full stream. It's just a little bit of a dribble. Um, this is an emergency. They can get very, very sick. It's very painful and they can die from this. So please call a vet as soon as you see signs. Um, this is one of the most common things I would see in the mainland. It's not as common here, but it does happen. We do import our feed from the mainland. Uh, as you can see here, it can happen from dietary reasons is the most common, but there are some other genetic factors. So the photo on the right shows that real stretched out look. It's a little bit extreme there, but usually they'll stand with their legs really camped out in front of them and you'll see them kind of straining as if they're trying to do something. They get that far away look in their eyes. Sometimes they'll cry potentially. Uh, the image over on the left shows just a little bit of where the, the likelihood of those stones getting stuck is. So usually it's somewhere along the urethra but generally at the very tip at the what we call the pizzle or the urethral process where the hose narrows dramatically and those are some of the little stones that can form and they can clog basically like a ball valve. So dystocia is a name of uh, basically any animal that has having any difficulty giving birth. So um, delayed, any kind of fetal maternal mismatch. So the, the kid or the lamb is too large. If it's in the wrong presentation, if there's a head back, if there's legs that are all tangled, um, that's all that term under that umbrella term of dystocia. Normal kidding and lambing should be all complete within 12 hours of showing those initial signs. So from the very beginning, of uh, maybe showing some signs of discomfort, um, separating themselves from the flock or the herd, uh, to the presence of that amnion, so that initial water bag, to delivery of the fetus or fetuses, depending on how many that she's having, and delivery of the placenta. It should all be done within 12 hours. Usually it's within 6 to 12 hours. For younger animals, it can be a little bit more delayed. Um, the biggest thing that I hear of or see is that um, a, a doe or a ewe will be going into labor first thing in the morning, uh, they don't see anything, and then they don't call until like three or four in the afternoon. By then, um, the survival of the baby is very low uh, with chances of causing major fatigue and uh, sickness in the mom. So please, if you know the animal is in active labor and you don't see anything within an hour, um, you might need to clean up your hands, wear some gloves, have a feel, do a vaginal exam and see what's going on. Or if you don't feel comfortable doing that, call for help. Um, she may need some assistance. As we talked about, the kid may be too big. It may have a leg back, a head back, and unable to deliver by itself. So seek help as soon as you can. Otherwise, um, you may lose the whole show. Be prepared if this is an animal that is a pet or has high value, that if you are waiting for this baby, this is a high concern. Be prepared for a, an eventual C-section or tell your veterinarian or whoever you're talking to what your goals are. Um, who the priority is. Try to know your breeding dates as, as close as you can. Uh, understand that that can't always happen, but familiar, familiarize yourself with normal signs of kidding and lambing. This extension site um, is really good. I think Dr. O'Donnell could potentially get you a link to this if you need to, um, but any of the extension sites, so there's University of Rhode Island or Pennsylvania, most of the universities have some wonderful uh, resources in terms of what normal kidding or lambing looks like and what to expect. So this uh, is are a few photos of um, prolapses. So the photo on the left is a prolapsed rectum, which is above just under the tail, and a prolapsed vagina. So this indicates most likely that there's a lot of intra-abdominal pressure and she's straining quite a lot. Vaginal prolapses generally happen before they kid or they lamb, usually within the last two to three weeks, usually within the last week generally. Most commonly with really over-conditioned or fatter 
water animals or multiple species bearing. These are generally not emergencies. Um, it happens when they lie down most commonly. More serious cases happen when they're standing or if they're straining at all times. Having a prolapse is, dis is uncomfortable, so then they tend to strain more. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. Uh, these can be cleaned and gently replaced on your by yourselves unless they stay out all the time. Um, I would give your veterinarian a call if you cannot replace it, if they're, it's out longer than um, right after you try to replace it, um, because sometimes it can create uh, problems for actually delivering babies. But this is... Um, not the end of the world. It definitely can be fixed. It's also a heritable condition, so keep an eye out for that. The situation over on the right is a uterine prolapse, so this is actually a true emergency. So this generally happens after kidding or lambing. So she's delivered the baby, she's passing the placenta, and for some reason she strains so hard that it basically inverts like a sock. Um, it's larger than just a vaginal prolapse. Vaginal prolapses just tend to be kind of a softball or tangerine-sized, uh, fleshy, smooth mass. Uterus, uh, uterine prolapses come out and they have all these little knobbly areas. Those are the maternal caruncles on the inside of the uterus that attach to the placenta. This is a, an emergency because there's large amounts of blood vessels that go to there. Um, what, as it comes out, it could potentially also prolapse the bladder and or other organs. Uh, it's a larger area to be traumatized, get infected, and needs to be seen as soon as possible. So please call your veterinarian if you see anything like this. So things that would be really helpful for producers to be able to do, you know, in the, in the meantime, say we can't get a hold of anybody or you want to call your veterinarian and they're going to ask you uh, some basic questions. So this helps you be as prepared as possible. So make sure you have a digital thermometer. It's going to be in your emergency kit list. Take a, a temperature. So use a digital thermometer in the rectum. That's the most accurate place to get a temperature. You have a quite varied uh, temperature range range for adult ruminants between 100.9 to 103 so they they tend to run hotter than humans if be aware that in uh, times of higher environmental temperatures if they've been running around or they've been in the car or a kennel or something like that they may be stressed and it can be a little bit higher uh, but really important information to be able to report to uh, your veterinarian or a technician who might be able to help you you can listen to their pulse or their heart rate either with just your hand you can feel Feel the heartbeat on the left side of the chest between the elbow basically and the chest. Um, each lub dub lub dub is a beat, so count the number of beats in 15 seconds, multiply by four, and that'll get you your resting heart rate in beats per minute. Um, in most adult resting animals, it's between 70 and 80. Generally, animals that I see on an exams, just because they're nervous and stressed, can be up to about 100. In your young lambs and kids, it's generally higher in the 120 to 140 range. At at rest. You can also buy a stethoscope to have in your kit. Um, you want to make sure that you get what a, a set that can fit easily in your ears and you're going to listen at the area where you feel the heartbeat the strongest. That's going to get you the most information. Similarly with respiratory rate, you're, you can either watch the chest rise and fall, you can watch the nostrils as they flare, you can hold your, your hand in front of the mouth or nose and feel as they um, have a breath out. Count those number of breaths in 15 seconds, multiply by four, that gets you your breaths per minute. In sheep and goats, panting is not normal um, as it is in dogs for heat stress and things like that. So if you are noticing that, that does indicate there could be some respiratory disease going on. Also, you can look at the hydration status. So when you lift up on the upper eyelid or skin of the neck or your own hand, you can kind of pinch your skin and pull it away a little bit. It should recoil immediately. If it stays tented or takes a, a, a few seconds to go back down, that indicates that they are dehydrated. Sometimes also the eyeballs can sink in the skull a little bit and look a little hollow when they're dehydrated. Um, FAMACHA score is the estimation of the mucous membrane color, the level of anemia. This is really important, especially if we're dealing with cases of parasitism. It should be a nice red pink color. Um, if they are associated or affected by parasites that suck blood, it will be very pale. Please note that it can be pale for other reasons as well. And again, this is a really important uh, tool that you can use for information to give a veterinarian as you're calling them. 
So triage, one of the most common things is bleeding. Um, I had a mentor who would tell me jokingly, all bleeding stops eventually. That does nothing for your anxiety levels, especially in one of those emergency situations. If it's really bright cherry red and there's a pulse that indicates there's a, an arterial bleed. Um, so that means that uh, there's going to be more bleeding and we need to stop that as much as possible. So pressure is, is better for that. If you get home and they're covered in dark red blood or there's a pool of blood or you don't see fresh flowing blood, that indicates venous bleeding and most likely will stop on its own, but could probably use um, a little bit of help in, in finding out where the bleeding is coming from. So try and identify where it is. If you have boys with scurs or horns or they get stuck in a fence or um, any kind of cuts or wounds, see if you can find that, that area. Try and clean the area um, with some antiseptic. Use a clean cloth, a flannel, paper towel, gauze bandages, whatever you can, and apply pressure to the source of the bleeding for a few minutes. See if you can hang on to that and then recheck. In a healthy, uh, normal animal, otherwise those causes of bleeding should stop if, with just some pressure. Um, sometimes, so if you're trimming hooves and you accidentally nick a quick or something like that, you can use styptic powder or blood stop powder, or if you don't have anything like that and you've got some excessive bleeding, cornstarch from the kitchen can work as well. Um, be sure to call a vet if there's uh, severe bleeding, so you get home and you see a lot of blood, um, or if it continues despite your actions. So this is an example of a guy who has some scurs that he would get into fights and um, look like a a homicide victim every once in a while. And here is an, is an example of fresh arterial blood. So you can see it's really bright cherry red. You can see all the drops and spatters there. So you can kind of see the difference between the two. Lameness is another really common presentation. So you get home from work and uh, when your goats or your sheep isn't walking on one of their legs, it can be as uh, simple as a uh, overgrown hoof, a uh, rock between the toes, hoof wall abscess, white line disease, something like that. Or uh, especially with young kids, they like to jump off of things, are very adventurous, get hung up in trees or fences. Um, so it can range from that to broken legs or to jointed infections, especially if it's a very young animal. So nursing kids and lambs are most uh, at risk for developing joint infections. And it shows up as a sudden, very, very painful swelling of a joint, usually the, the front knee, the carpus or the hock in the back. Um, so as you can see in this photo on the top right there, uh, the right leg is swollen about two, two times bigger than the left there. They didn't see anything happen, but just noticed that she was walking, uh, limping around and that there was all that swelling. When I clipped up the hair, you can see an indent just above her hawk on the right there. She'd gotten strung up in some fencing probably and then gotten herself out, but she'd done quite a lot of soft tissue damage and bruising there. So um, it can be pretty varied and you might not be able to tell what the exact source of lameness is. You can kind of localize it. Is it higher up in the leg or in the foot? Most of lameness is in the foot if it's common, but uncommon things happen as well. Try to put the animal in a confined space. You can do a basic exam again, get that temperature pulse and respiration. Um, see if you can move all the joints. Does the, mo does the leg move with um, abnormal movement? Is there any kind of crunching? Uh, um, and you could potentially immobilize with an ACE bandage or other bandage material. It's very important that it's not too tight because you might cut off circulation. Um, if you're using a splint or something, you need to be very careful that it's padded so it's not going to cause a cast sore. Uh, but when in doubt, just call a veterinarian to, to check it out. Make sure, rule out that there might not be a broken bone or an infected joint or something like that. So diarrhea is again a, another common presentation that we see in 90% of cases in Hawaii. It's generally parasites. Um, in association, I think Dr. O'Donnell is going to talk to you about the star point uh, examination and all the other signs of parasites, but you're going to see diarrhea, the pale FAMACHA score sometimes, uh, thin, poor body condition, bottle jaw, so swelling under the jaw, an indication of low proteins in the blood. In younger animals, it's most generally cocktail 
coccidia and those that are less than about four to six months old, um, but can also be uh, the other intestinal parasites as well. But don't uh, let that kind of cloud your judgment. There are other things that can cause diarrhea. So grain overload, getting into too much grain, getting into the chicken feed, getting into um, excess fruits or veggies or something like that, too many treats that can cause indigestion. Um, toxins, so some plant toxins can cause GI signs. Generally, they cause other things first before you see that, but just in case, that's always a possibility and on our list. Bacterial infections such as salmonella and clostridium can cause diarrhea. Uh, it also generally causes more uh, severe clinical signs such as an elevated temperature, an animal that's sick, not wanting to eat. Yoni's disease can be a cause of diarrhea in adults, but not always. And then mineral deficiencies, especially in Hawaii, we have low copper, zinc, selenium, and cobalt. Um, so always a possibility. The best way to do this is to get a fecal sample if you can, have that checked for fecal egg counts, parasites, treating with an effective dewormer. If you have no improvement, I would seek help sooner rather than later, especially because a lot of energy and protein can be lost in uh, diarrhea, especially with young kids. Uh, they can go downhill pretty quickly. So again, if you have any bottle babies that are having diarrhea that doesn't clear up within a day, uh, give us a call. So when you have a down animal, you get home from work or you wake up in the morning and you've got a goat that's down. Um, this is generally an emergency. It depends on exactly what is causing this. There can be many different causes. So you need to give them the most information um, that you have as possible. So how old is it? Uh, is it a neutered male? Is it, is she pregnant? Is it a baby? Like, um, if she is pregnant, do you know the breeding dates? Do you know how far along she is? What are you feeding? Did they get into any chicken feed, any toxic plants in the area, any grass clippings or garden plants that were thrown into the pasture, um, any chance that any dogs or any other kind of things have been around? Uh, any time I get any call, I always ask if it's a male, have you seen him urinate or not? Because until proven otherwise, um, all males are assumed to be have urinary obstruction. So in these cases, um, you can have uh, so many different potential causes and it's really important to kind of rule out which ones may or may not may be higher on the list because they have different treatments. So on the left here, we have a very, very pregnant doe. She had multiple fetuses seen on ultrasound. Her due date is in about 10 days, but she's down. She's really not eating very much, uh, really slow and lethargic. So the most common... Um, thing that would be going on with her would be pregnancy toxemia or ketosis. So her babies are basically draining all of her energy and she has nothing left and so she goes ketotic. But it can look very similar if the, and the, the treatment would be very different if she did get into a bunch of grain by accident or if that was bloat and not babies um, in our very pregnant or um, Animals that are lactating a lot or milking high amounts, they can also get very low calcium and appear very similar. Uh, if she was close to giving birth, it could be considered dystocia, just depending on what we find on our physical exam and where she is. Uh, the case in the middle could be just about anything if it has progressed severely enough. So in severe cases of pneumonia, they can be so weak and so debilitated, they can be out flat. Uh, Males that have these urinary obstructions, if the, the urinary bladder has ruptured or if there are severe metabolic derangements, they can be down. Some kind of toxins potentially, or neurologic um, issues, metabolic disease, so again ketosis or other things like that. Trauma, um, animals can die from stress sometimes. The case on the right uh, is a weather that was showing neurological signs. So um, his head is in an abnormal position. When he would stand, he would go in circles um, and just be very abnormal. So this could be an indication of some kind of neurologic toxin or a brain or spinal cord infection. Uh, listeriosis is very high, especially if they have a head tilt. So one ear or eye is lower than the other basically, that can indicate there could be a neurological lesion. Blindness or circling or staggering, seem uncoordinated, that could all be some kind of neurological toxin or uh, metabolic derangement. Uh, polioencephalomalacia is thiamine deficiency that can happen uh, with toxins or a few other uh, 
um, causes. So really important to kind of know what our factors are because it really directs our treatment. So what to have in your emergency kit. So we talked about um, some common causes of emergencies, when it is a really good idea to call in, when it's a good idea, when you can kind of do things yourself until you need some help. Um, but when in doubt, just, just give someone a call. But say it is a Sunday afternoon and you can't get a hold of anybody or you've called and everybody's out on calls already and they can't get to you, it's a good idea to have some, some things on hand just in case. You need to work with your veterinarian because they might actually be able to prescribe you some medications to have on hand that are normally prescription. Um, but if you are directed in a way to use them appropriately, at least you've got something that you can give um, while waiting for direction or for a physical exam. Or if you have a veterinarian that you work with closely so you have regular exams and they know, know what's happening with your animals, it might be a good idea to have a few things on hand. Um, these are shaped based on what your particular needs are. If you have breeding animals or if you have a dairy or are milking your goats, you might need some a few different things than others. Especially with babies, you need to have a few different things. You can have your own little dystocia kit or lambing or, or kidding kit that has everything all together for if you need to assist in a delivery or something like that. So this is just kind of a, a blanket list. Uh, there's obviously things that you can change, uh, use that might suit your situation better, add whatever you'd like, but these are just a kind of good, good starting point. So definitely that digital thermometer, you can use a mercury one if you want, but it tends to break. Uh, digital ones tend to be pretty, pretty quick and also pretty cheap. Any kind of gloves, nitrile or latex gloves, I understand they're more difficult to find nowadays. Um, some general bandage material so some non-stick padding, some gauze squares, uh, an ace bandage or two, even some uh, vet, vet wrap or Coflex, so something like that. If you go into any of the feed stores in the horse aisle, normally they have some bandage material and it's a, just a good idea to have some on hand. Be really careful with those really stretchy um, self-sticking bandages, the vet wraps, because you can make them too tight. So you want to be very, very careful that you're not wrapping too tight or otherwise you can cause um, some major issues. Have some antiseptic on hand, either betadine or chlorhexidine base, whatever makes you happy. Either either or is good for me. Um, some isopropyl alcohol, that's also good as an antiseptic or a cleaner. Also good to cool down an animal that's in heat stress or something like that. Having a, a small amount of lubricant is good, especially if you are going to be assisting in any deliveries. You want to make sure that you're not causing any damage. A uh, little thing, a super glue, so just general crazy glue can be useful if you have something like a scur that breaks off and a little bit of a bleeder or a tissue wound or something like that. It can be useful in a pinch. A blood stop powder we were talking about, there's a variety of different ones. You can look online on Amazon or Petco for a similar product. Um, some kind of wound spray, so either like a blue coat or Alu Shield or Vetresin or something like that just to, to spray over a wound can be useful. A variety of syringes and needles is also useful when you're going to be administering medications. Um, speaking of medications, as we talked about, consult with your veterinarian. They might be able to prescribe you some medications to have on hand, such as banamine, which is a non steroidal anti inflammatory. It needs to be given at very specific dose rates and can have some withholding time. So that's why it's really important to consult your veterinarian to figure out if that's something that you can have on hand or how to best um, uh, utilize that medication similar with most antibiotics now. There are products called Nutrigent or Dine or other kind of oral um, nutritional supplements. Those are nice to have on hand, especially for animals that aren't eating uh, to give, give, help give them a little bit of a boost. Some of the probiotics also can be useful. Having a dewormer on hand might be useful for you as well. Be sure to consult with your veterinarian to find out what's most appropriate or works the best in your herd or your flock. Vitamin C complexes or vitamin B complex, excuse me, is useful to have on hand. Um, you can't really give too much of it and it's usually a nice supplemental addition for, for most things. Uh, as we mentioned, some kind of antibiotic. I think penicillin is still available from feed stores, but it might be phased out in the next year or so. So again, work with your, your veterinarian in terms of what they feel comfortable or what they think would be most appropriate for your situation. Baking soda and Maalox can be useful for in times of bloat or 
for grain overload or dietary indigestion. So have those all ready. And as we talked about before, if you have uh, lambs or kids, it would be a good idea potentially to add something like a feeding tube, maybe some dextrose or some caro syrup or something like that, that and some warming uh, uh, paraphernalia, whatever you might need just for the kids. So there are key points for this presentation was know when to ask for help. Um, have your veterinarian's number available for emergencies, especially if you go out of town and you have someone else watching. Um, some of the most frantic calls I've received are from pet sitters or from the neighbor who's looking after the animal and something happens and there's an emergency and they didn't know who to call and they don't know what to do. So prepare for an event and hope that it doesn't actually happen. Try to collect as much information as you can to give your vet to help you, especially over the phone. Uh, we will generally always ask the questions, what kind of animal is it? How old is it? What have you been feeding? Uh, what are your, the signs that you're seeing? If you can be as specific and complete as possible, that really helps us frame um, the best kind of potential causes of the sickness and treatments and prognosis as well. Um, prevention and preparation are essential for success as we discussed, like knowing when the most appropriate time to call in for help will save you in the long run. If you have any questions, uh, my email is on the front slide there, christy at yourvetmaui.com. I am doing some telemedicine consultations, so if you do want to chat about things, please go ahead and give me a, a, send me an email, or you can give our office a call, 808-879-5777. I can get Dr. O'Donnell more information for that. Um, so yes, please go ahead and do I just want to say thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, please direct your questions to Dr. O'Donnell or my email or phone number. Thank you.